Okay, so I thought that this would be good to do because we haven't discussed uh, Gibbous deformity case uh, in a little while, and then Dror sort of stole my thunder. But um, uh, I think it'll be interesting still for discussion because we treated this and handled it a little bit uh, differently. Uh, the picture on the left, for those of you who don't know, that's our newest partner, Ken Illingworth, and this was actually a case of um, that presented while he was on call and I helped him with it and uh, we did a better job of taking pictures of this one so it shows the story a little better than the one that I had, uh, the few that I had previously. So this is sort of a kind of early tweener group, eight-year-old male with thoracic level spina bifida, his shunted hydrocephalus and gibbous deformity. He'd been managed uh, outside, been following up with a plastic surgeon, and they'd been trying to conservatively manage the wound breakdown. And you can see from these pictures that the conservative management was pretty suboptimal. So they were not making good headway on that front. the MRI that is not playing right now would show you that there's some osteomyelitis at the uh, apical vertebrae. Hmm. Can you click on the picture? Yeah. I'll raise your mouse over the bottom. Mm. I'm hovering fairly unsuccessfully. So um, <laughs> we'll just go ahead and move on. So, I mean, we basically are missing the posterior mount. So it, just a review from the x-ray, looks like this. So what do you want to do now? Let's have a show of hands. Debris, plastics coverage, try to wait until the skin is healed to address the deformity. Debride, wound vac, and then try to address the deformity acutely at this admission, not necessarily the same surgery, but sort of right away, and then do something else. So who's for A? Wanna wait? Who wants to do? Okay, so B is the winner, which was what won out. We did have a fair amount of debate about this in uh, conference, and I will tell you it was not unanimous about, uh, amongst our partners, but there is, I think, if you're not getting rid of that pressure point, it is oftentimes hard to get the skin to heal. So, um, so then the question is, do you, he's almost nine, but very small. Do you wanna do kyphectomy, a definitive fusion? Do you want to do kyphectomy and some distraction-based, grow either growing rods or vector, let's just say B is d your distraction-based option, kyphectomy and some growth guidance or something else. So who wants to do kyphectomy and definitively fuse through this area? So, okay. And kyphectomy and a distraction-based system. No takers on that. Kyphectomy and some growth guidance. Okay. And anybody else going D? Other? No? No. Okay. Okay. And then, um, uh, so this is going to be a little bit uh, different depending upon what you're um, doing, but in terms of fixation, what do people typically like for fixation options for the pelvis for spina bifida? Who's putting hooks in there? like an S-hook or a pelvic saddle type of option? No one. Um, okay, one, few. Um, okay, well, I'll show you uh, what I did. And this is just, I think we all know this, but kids have been harmed by having procedures like this uh, without having a working shunt. So just make sure, even though we're all aware that you should open the garage door before you back out, don't make that mistake. Okay, all right, so this is just to tell you, so we did the resection of the involved area. This is just to give you a sense of how incredibly small this kid is. Um, and this is the technique that I kind of wanted to show because it's really been a game changer in my practice. I see a fair amount of spina bifida um, and I tried a lot of different options, uh, but as opposed to when you do like a Galveston type rod and you get a lot of wiggle from putting an implant down there, here you're going through uh, end plate and disc, so they're really, really solid. Um, so we put, cannula or we put the guide wires down and then I drill over it with a cannulated drill. And then 
bend uh, the rod, and I'll show you here. So I bend two 90 degree angles with the rod so that you get bone to bone opposition so that you're, the place where you've done the resection, the bone actually keys in together so that that then solidly fuses. And so when you, when you first put it in, um, you know, the rods are sticking way out and you, I hammer that down until the rods are flush with the bone so that that doesn't interfere with the fusion. And one of the real advantages here is you really don't have to even expose distally. So your incision distally is kind of non-existent, which is oftentimes where I was struggling with wound breakdown problems with these children. So we did that. Now, because he was really small, we did, um, uh, and we didn't want kind of an abrupt transition. So he is almost nine. We did uh, put, want to get some solid anchors above there. So we put in three screws. And then the ones above that, we didn't do any periosteal dissection. Those are all just placed percutaneously. And so we have this construct. So I don't know how much he'll grow. I mean, he's, uh, again, his bone age doesn't appear to be delayed, and he's almost nine. So he may not get to a very old age or get to a very large dimension. But at least we feel like we kind of gave him the opportunity to potentially grow off the rods if he wants to. Um, and this is what his skin looks like now. So, thoughts, questions, comments? Hmm? We took four levels out, yeah. Yeah, I think one of the other things I've learned in doing these is you have to take out more than you think. Um, and you have to take out some of that part that's, um, you have to get kind of to the curve of the lordosis because otherwise you don't have any bone that uh, is in opposition to your other bone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I have a few of these, and I switched to doing more of this construct about three years ago. And I will say, like, I haven't seen a huge amount of growth, but I haven't seen, I haven't needed to like take anybody back for them, and they seem to have good sitting balance. Um, so, so far, I've been pretty happy with it. I'm definitely much happier with doing the distal fixation this way um, than anything that I had tried before that. And I've, I think, with not opening up the area distally. It is, uh, it's just so much easier to get that part to heal. So that's really been a game changer for me. Do you consider the osteomyelitis to be cured by taking the segment out? Or we did you treat them with antibiotics? Uh, we uh, did, yeah, we did treat them with antibiotics. I believe we did either two or three weeks. We had, uh, we discussed it with ID. I mean, I, I yes, we, we cut out the whole area that had osteo. Um, but at the same time, I, I, you know, you essentially have a dirty field. So we did a little bit of, maybe it's overkill, but I'd rather do that than have it infected. Again, I mean, as we all know, the complication rate with these kids is really high and the infection rate is really high. So I think throwing a little extra antibiotics on them, I, I will defend my grave. Um, that, it kind of a little bit depends on the kid, but that was a 5.5 five, uh, plus rod, a cobalt chrome rod. Um, uh, tie off the fecal sac, and we we have uh, I have our neurosurgeons do that. I think they do a better job than I can. It's just, uh, this mouse and me are not. Anybody else? Take away. Uh, yeah, take this one down, and then we're gonna put uh, that one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 